It's been long known in the scientific community that skeletal muscle and muscle quality really contributes to metabolic health by way of improving glucose utilization, insulin sensitivity, and also leptin sensitivity. And today we're going to unpack a new study that quantified the levels of which healthy skeletal muscle is linked with metabolically healthy phenotypes or states of metabolic flexibility in 20,000 subjects. Then we're going to talk about a new study that found that resistance training to failure actually increases fat oxidation. Now, I want to unpack just a few little notes about that, and then we're going to continue on to talk about the details because it's been long known again that resistance training sort of contributes to a healthy body composition and may increase fat oxidation through an indirect mechanism. That is by increasing your body's resting metabolic rate. So the more lean muscle mass you have, the higher your RMR or your resting metabolic rate is. So therefore you can oxidize more energy throughout the day by just sitting still. Like it's your potential energy to burn uh, calories and so forth is, is just higher. And so a lot of people will talk about, well, you should prioritize resistance training uh, through that mechanism. But we're going to talk about in just a few moments a new study that found that resistance training to failure actually epigenetically increases a signaling mechanism that directly enhances fat oxidation. And this is the first sort of, it's a novel, recently discovered mechanism, and we're going to unpack that. I think it's a really a fascinating study. We're going to talk about the details and the nuances. But first, let's talk about muscle quality and this marbled meat-like appearance that is characteristic in individuals who have insulin resistance, that is. So we're going to talk about ectopic fat deposition and marbled meat. What that is, is that is a characteristic of a state of insulin resistance. And you have a lot of free fatty acids and, and so forth floating around these non-esterified fats, and they're depositing in tissues. This, these are when your fat cells get overfilled and overstuffed stuffed and enlarged. And so you have this fatty acid spillover. So you get buildup in your liver, which we've talked about on recent podcasts, the importance of blood testing, looking at your liver enzymes, AST, ALT, and GGT, and alkaline phosphatase and all these other enzymes. Uh, we've talked about that before. And also you get buildup in, uh, in, in your heart and in your pancreas, but also in your skeletal muscle. And so this ectopic fat buildup, what's known as myosteatosis, uh, you've heard about non-alcoholic steatosis, and so that's fat buildup in the liver, uh, or also known as NASH. Now, this is fat building up in the muscle. Now, remember that about 70% of the carbohydrates, after a carbohydrate-enriched meal, about 70% of those that glucose goes into your muscle tissue. Now, of course, that number dramatically diminishes if you're more insulin resistant, and this is why skeletal muscle is so important to metabolic health. Now, what's unique about this new study, and the title of which is Comparison of Muscle Mass and Quality Between Metabolically Healthy and Unhealthy Phenotypes. This was recently published in the Journal of Obesity. And so here's the details. A recently published study of approximately 20,000 subjects found a strong correlation between metabolic health and the degree of muscle fatness. So there's a correlation. The more metabolically unhealthy or insulin resistant you are, the more unhealthy your muscle phenotype is, and that's quantifiable. And what these scientists found was on a CT scan. So they, they were able to create a new assay of sorts. Now, I'm not recommending you run out and get a CT scan because there is a lot of iatrogenesis or um, you know unintended harms associated with that due to the radiation. But we might be able to start looking at this if you have to get a CT scan for some other you know, reason or something like that, um, you might be able to actually use some of those imaging to to uh, quantify your level of muscle fatness. But again, I'm not promoting uh, everyone get out and get a CT scan. You want to minimize uh, CT scan due to the radiation. However, um, the team developed, this research team that is in South Korea, uh, they developed a reliable new assay to look at muscle quality in humans using CT images combined with metabolically healthy indices. And poor metabolic health was defined as having two or more components of the metabolic syndrome, which many of you know, it's insulin resistance, it's high triglycerides, it's uh, waist to hip ratio and visceral adiposity, uh, blood pressure, things like that. So if you have two or more of these unhealthy phenotypes, uh, this was statistically in an independently correlated with muscle fatness. So that marbled meat like appearance of, you know, say if you go to the store and you see maybe, maybe a ribeye, some, some of the New York's uh, strips and so forth have sort of a more marbled meat characteristic. Definitely some of the 70-30 ground will have more of that marbled appearance. Um, 
And again, so this is, we see this in animals when they're given foods that they're not normally uh, supposed to eat. Uh, so if we think about animals being fed corn and soy and so forth, uh, especially, you know, um, you know, the sort of the feedlot beef, guess what? It's going to have more of a marbled meat-like appearance. And if your muscle tissue has that characteristic, well, guess what? That will actually compromise your muscle's ability to be more insulin sensitive, more glucose sensitive, and much more. So higher levels of poor muscle quality were found in metabolically unhealthy subjects when compared to metabolically healthy individuals. Interestingly, even though obese subjects tended to have higher levels of overall muscle mass compared to non-obese subjects, the obese subjects had significantly higher levels of poor quality muscle. Even more, the presence of poor quality muscle was independently associated with an increased risk of metabolic syndrome in non-obese men and women. So muscle quality, super important. Now, we've talked in other episodes about this sort of triad between muscle, fat tissue, and bone. And the term is called osteosarcopenic obesity. And this is characteristic of individuals who are overweight, they tend to lose muscle, and then they lose bone as well. So this is very important, friends. And resistance training, walking, uh, loading your body is important. Now, we're gonna get into some of the details in just a moment when we talk about that new study that showed that resistance training to failure using seven reps actually increased fat oxidation. But first, I just want to welcome you back. It's Mike Mutzel. I am grateful that you are tuning into this video. If you're enjoying this podcast in iTunes, Spotify, or here on YouTube, please hit that like button. That really helps. And you can leave a comment and you can also share this with a friend or family member. As we continue on, I just want to remind you the importance of sleep. Sleep could be the single most important thing that you optimize in your life. A lot of people are fine tuning their diet, their exercise, and all that is important, but all that can be sort of compromised if you're not getting good quality sleep, if you're not optimizing your body's circadian rhythms, if you're falling asleep, then waking up, you're ready to hit the day, but it's only two in the morning. So we like to focus on sleep over at our sister company, Myoscience Nutrition. We have a lot of great sleep supporting bundles for you, including the new sleep enhancer bundle that has a liquid, super clean, organic, non-GMO certified hemp oil with a, uh, with a micronutrient powder that tastes phenomenal, that has L-theanine, GABA, magnesium, taurine, and we actually added a few new micronutrients, including potassium and glycine to help you optimize your sleep. So you can hop on over to myoscience.com. That's myoscience with an X, M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com. Check out the Sleep Enhancer Bundle and the upgraded and improved Myo Relax and Calm. It's a customer favorite. You can use the coupon code podcast at checkout. So let's continue on and talk about how resistance training can actually directly increase fat oxidation. Now, again, this is a brand new scientific study. The title of this is Mechanical Overload Induced Muscle Derived Extracellular Vesicles Promote Adipose Tissue Lipolysis. Now, let's just pause here. There's a lot of jargonistic biologic terms here that you, know, you can see how even if this, this article came across your feed, you may not really note the importance of this. So I do want to uh, thank my friend, Sal DiStefano. We did a podcast last Thursday that's coming out in the next several weeks about resistance training as a fat loss modality and, and some of the nuances and details when it comes to practical you know, programming and implementation. So definitely check that out. I, but I do want to thank Sal for making me aware of this new study. And uh, so this is a very fascinating study. And what's unique about this, and I know a lot of you women that tune into the podcast will like this, is this was a mixed gender study. There was 20, over 20 volunteers. And what they actually instructed the study subjects to do was they found their, their one rep max when it comes to a leg extension and a, um, a leg press. And they wanted to then, okay, figure out, okay, what is their, their maximum output here? And let's do some mathematics and figure out what would be their seven rep max. Now, why did they come up with the seven rep max? I'm not really sure. I think they wanted to cause, uh, that's sort of in that bodybuilding rep range from six to 10 reps, sort of. You know, if you think powerlifting is, is really sort of lower rep range, between one and three reps, you know, um, max, def max effort sort of exercises. But bodybuilding is sufficient to cause muscle hypertrophy and maybe some signaling. So that might be why the scientists um, settled on this seven rep range. But they had subjects, you know, so they figured out their strength and then they had them come back to the lab perform these exercises, and then they did some uh, genetic analysis and some biopsies and, and looked at gene arrays and, and looked at gene expression. So again, there's two different exercises. They went to failure. They failed at seven reps. Now, this is important to sort of pause and underscore because I've been using the term lift to failure for a long time, but I realize some people don't know this. So when you go to failure, what that means is you don't have any more effort left in the tank. So if we think about a squat, if you're doing 10 repetitions of a squat, if you say you know, 10 reps to failure. What that means is that on the 10th rep, that's it. Like you, you don't have anything more. Your legs are burning, your glutes are burning, you're winded, you're out of breath. 
And so again, this was sufficiently, now, now it's important to know that intensity matters when it comes to exercise. I see a lot of people that are going to the gym and bless their hearts, they're moving their muscles way better than sitting on the couch. But if you're sort of not you know, engaging your muscles and there's not a little bit of load there, you're not causing the necessary signaling and adaptations that will lead to these health benefits. Okay, so I'm getting off track, but let's go back. So they, they had these individuals do a leg press and then leg extension. I think it was two different sets. Um, uh, the total on the, on the seventh rep, they failed. They did some biopsies and genetic analysis. They also had an animal arm of the, of the study, but you're a human, so let's focus on the human arm. And what they found is that in the post-exercise window, there was this extracellular vesicle, this little spherical-like structure. And inside that was a microRNA. So it's a non-coding. So if we think about your DNA, RNA goes to protein. So the, essentially, epigenetically, it, intense exercise was then able to, to sort of signal then to the fat tissue by way of this vesicle. So again, it's a direct mechanism. This isn't sort of indirect triangulation uh, you know, where you're increasing your resting metabolic rate by way of exercise. This was literally a direct epigenetic signal coming, stemming from the muscle tissue that targeted white adipose tissue. So white is different than brown adipose tissue and so forth. And through sort of a, a, a series of complex mechanisms that we're not going to talk about today because it, it gets into the weeds of the, of the intracellular biochemistry within the fat cell itself, but there was some increased sensitization to catecholamine stimulation of lipolysis. So essentially what lipolysis is, you know, fat cells can either take in energy or they can release energy. And lipolysis is when the fat cells or the adipose tissue releases energy. And so of course you need to also then have healthy mitochondria and all of this, but this is just one direct aspect uh, linking exercise to fat oxidation. Now, I think this is quite fascinating because well, there's many different reasons for this, but it's been long known, I've known this for over 20 years, that when you lift weights, you improve your body composition and you, you don't have as much body fat. Now, part of this, I always sort of thought, and this was what was talked about in textbooks and research, and it was talked about in my undergrad biology classes and so forth, is that the more muscle you have, the higher your, your resting metabolic rate is. So the more buffer or the more, you know, sort of... Um, Poor food choices, you have buffering capacity associated with that, right? So you know, if you're burning 3,000 calories a day, maybe you can afford some pizza and some ice cream and still kind of look shredded, so to speak, even though those aren't considered, say, say healthy or good qualities. But here we have this new study that shows that pushing your muscles to failure can directly enhance your fat cells' ability to release stored energy. And so, of course, there's that other side of the equation, right? The lipolysis is one thing. Fat oxidation is a little bit different, well, very different, because fat oxidation occurs within the mitochondria, within your muscle tissue and your liver, right? So you need you need a little bit more, you know, this isn't, we, we can't quantify how many pounds will you lose if you exercise to failure, per se, from this one scientific study. But I think it's important to realize because there is this fat cell flux, and this is something that we've talked about on this podcast for a while, where, you know, a lot of your fat lipids, they're just recycled and there's this sort of glycerol turnover and there's this churn and this churn of fat declines as you become more insulin resistant. So I think if you can improve that fat cell flux and improve the health of, of lipolysis and so forth and the sensitivity of your adrenaline and noradrenaline to become more sensitive to uh, increasing the release of stored energy, that's probably a good thing. Now, what, what comes to mind here is resistance training might also be uh, a good thing to kickstart a fast, or it might be good in the morning because your, your catecholamines are much higher. Now, your, your cortisol is also higher, that, and, and cortisol is, is linked with more muscle catabolism and things like that. So you know, that's, that's sort of interesting to, to sort of think about exercise timing and so on. But I think this is just another fascinating study, another sort of reminder about the importance of resistance training when it comes to metabolic health and the importance of having healthy skeletal muscle uh, because that contributes to whole body glucose metabolism, leptin, and insulin sensitivity. So both of those are correlated. And now we have this new study to show that going to failure. So you know, what's the take home here? Where, where do you go from here? How, how can you apply, um, sort of translate this bench to bedside, this science that's coming out? How do you translate that into your life? Well, I do just want to mention, 
We've done many podcasts in the past. So the most recent would be with my own personal trainer, Dan Stephenson, and we talked about programming and uh, isometric exercises, um, you know, how to structure an exercise program for strength versus hypertrophy. Please check out and re-listen to that episode if you haven't yet and check out the show notes. Phenomenal episode. We've also caught up with Brett Contreras, the author of The Glute Lab. And so the amazing book uh, and resource and, and podcast for you uh, to learn about how to customize a program that is lower body centric. A lot of people focus on sort of the, the mere muscles, the chest, the biceps and so forth and abs, but you have your lats, your back, your glutes, your posture, your chain, your hamstrings, some of the biggest muscles in your body and very important to make sure that the health of those muscles is being supported by resist, resistant training. So definitely check out those episodes. And we do uh, have a, an upcoming show with Sal Stefano, which is phenomenal. He has a great book called The Resistance Training Revolution. So those are some things that you can you know, sort of take away. We do have a great course with you that, that for you that we put together with Dan Stephenson and his significant other, Tasha, uh, that's all about how to properly perform the squat, the deadlift, uh, hip hinges, and so forth. So you can check that out in the show notes, um, courses.highintensityhealth.com where I will also link some of the, the nutri nutrients that we talked about to support your sleep and also some of these articles because I think this the science is fascinating. We, it'll, we will never get bored talking about uh, muscle and the nuances and its correlations with you know, healthy metabolism and insulin sensitivity and much more. So uh, just to finish off, I personally lift four days per week and I split up my upper body and lower body on every other day you know, so um, or every third day. So I'll do upper body pulling, one day, and then I'll do lower body pulling the next day. And when I say pulling, that's more posterior chain. So it's going to be hip hinges, deadlifts, you know, um, hip thrusts, things like that. Then I'll do upper body pressing. So there's going to be pressing exercises, chest, shoulders, triceps. Uh, then I'll do lower body pressing on another day. So that's going to be more quad focused, more front of the leg. But of course, that still does involve the glutes. So that's just what I do. I, I like the four-day-a-week program. Um, you can get results doing three days a week, but you're going to really have to fine-tune your nutrition as well. I think frequency matters when it comes to muscle. Now, just figuring out what's going to work for you, if you can do this in your backyard, have a kettlebell, a TRX, you know, some bands, I think that's going to be helpful. But remember, this intensity matters. So um, you want to start to fail or, or start to really feel that burn, I should say. Maybe not every single exercise, but around, you know, eight to 10 reps. If, if you're you know, just going through the motions like this and you can easily do 20 reps, you do not have enough weight on the bar or resistance there. So friends, I'm grateful that you tuned all the way in. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thanks for subscribing. If you decide to share this on Instagram, my handle is metabolic underscore Mike. I would like to hear from you. Have an awesome rest of your day and we'll catch up with you soon. Bye now. Yeah.